from the shores of Miami Beach in Florida. We are broadcasting the uh, daily dose of neurosurgery education with Chandra Deo Pujari, noted Indian neurosurgery uh, educator, as well as endoscopist and skull-based surgeon. Uh, okay, uh, we're going to uh, introduce the guest first, quickly. Okay, uh, could I... Could, uh, thanks for the introduction, John. I, I like to think myself of uh, more of a general neurosurgeon uh, <laughs> species which is on the decline right now. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, we, we, we brought up when specialities have been just developing, so we had a chance to dabble in everything. Uh, so let's, let's talk about endoscopy for hydrocephalus, what's the current status uh, uh, of the technology. And uh, it was not until uh, Vesalius published his uh, work on the ventricles and tried to tell us as to what was the fluid circulation like. We all believed that, uh, you know, uh, taking fluid out from brain was taking out evil, etc, etc. And the pathophysiology of CSF circulation uh, became more and more clear. The idea of uh, the fact that uh, it was just diffusing out rather than having a particular pathway was uh, also discovered only during this time. Though as many of you must be knowing that uh, there is a theory of bulk flow which probably goes through these main channels and there is a uh, there is an alternative passage or what is called uh, the invisible flow which, which goes from various other sources into the subarachnoid space uh, as is being discovered uh, with every passing day. There's a beautiful article by Ashoff in Neurosurgical Review, which takes you through the whole development of how hydrocephalus was diagnosed earlier, the Greco-Roman uh, uh, explanations to begin with, who mainly dealt with this, what uh, benefits the lumbar puncture gave and what it taught us about uh, CSF circulation. And in fact, as early as 1908, Ventriculostomy without implants was discussed, though was abandoned very quickly because of high mortality. The modern technique has developed of endoscopy with the development of cystoscope, which people tried to put in the ventricles from time to time. Choroid plexus fulguration was the first procedure which was done. And Dandy actually did a third ventriculostomy by an open approach. And Faye in 1923 did a corpus callosal fistula. So basically the concept was existing, but the technology was missing and it was only Mixter uh, who attempted the third ventriculostomy for the first time. And then it became uh, the job of the neurosurgeons to find which patients are likely to benefit. And the early paper in 1978 from Nottingham shows you that greater criteria for selection were required to make sure that more and more patients benefited from this technology. And Robert Jones from uh, Australia, uh, from where Charlie Teo also comes and uh, has started his career with Robert Jones over there. He was the first person who tried to show you that it was the congenital non-communicating hydrocephalus where uh, the ETV was the best, unlike the Arnold Carey malformation and the spina bifida patients. So today, if we look at uh, the fact that when we see a patient with hydrocephalus, how do we diagnose hydrocephalus? I think the MR has the best way. You see the ventriculomegaly, you see the enlargement of third ventricular recess, decreased mammulopontine distance, thinning on elevation of the corpus callosum, normal narrowed cortical sulci, periventricular white matter hyperintensities, and uh, uh, a sign of communicating hydrocephalus is aqueductal flow void phenomena, and it would be absent if you have aqueductal stenosis. Recently, three or four years ago, I think it was 19, uh, 2014, when there was a very good literature review and evidence-based guidelines which the American Pediatric Neurosurgery Group tried to give us and they compared the results uh, till that time about cerebrospinal fluid shunts versus ETV for treatment of hydrocephalus in children and came out with the recommendation that level two moderate clinical certainty that both CSF shunts and ETV are equally good options. So let us talk a little bit about the technique of third ventriculostomy. There are minor differences between how we do things uh, uh, in various people, but the principle remains the same. You make a burr hole 
uh, parasagittal somewhere along the near the coronal suture and try to get through the foron of munro through the floor of the third ventricle uh, most people would do it under general anesthesia most people make a scalp flap rather than a straight incision so that the chances of csf leak decrease the head is elevated 15 degrees most of us would do a needle tap first to sample csf use a sheath or may not use a sheath depending on what is your status now peel away sheaths are fairly expensive so you can use a metal sheath which comes with the endoscope or you can actually do the procedure without the sheath monopolar probe is a must with you should not use with uh, energy when you are doing the first perforation but may be required occasionally and fogarty balloon is the common thing which we use uh, for uh, dilating uh, your third ventricle ostrum there are there are uh, differences of opinion as to what is the optimal birth hole position and people who have done stereotactically guided procedures way back in 2000 uh, this is a paper from um, uh, minds which showed that it should be 3 cm lateral and 2 cm anterior to the coronal suture uh, if you look at the barrow uh, paper recently they have shown that the optimal entry point for etv was probably more posterior than previously established this they did with the navigation uh, another paper which has come from there which shows that more lateral you go uh, more front you have to come so nearer the midline you need to go behind La more lateral if you make a bur hole you need to come in front and uh, another paper which has shown that uh, uh, when you are actually doing the uh etv the entry point correlates uh, usually with the ventricular size so if you have a large ventricular size you can literally make bur hole anywhere and you can reach the third ventricular floor but in a smaller ventricle sticking to the standard bur hole uh, is very very important the other thing is unnecessarily coagulating the dura is not a good idea because once the raised pressure goes away the tamponade effect goes away and you can get subdural effusions and you can get csf leaks through the wound and to prevent that most people therefore i said take a flap and try to close the dura or cover the dura with either gel foam and glue or something like that so what are the clear features for etv ben warf who has done a lot of work in africa did not have the advantage of uh, having uh, uh, the mri while doing the etvs and he he has virtually treated all comers for uh, hydrocephalus and we'll talk about his work a little later on but in an ideal situation you should have a t2 weighted image you should have a t2 weighted image in uh, uh, t1 and t2 sequences uh, most pa patients do not require a contrast image you should be able to see a clear evidence of ventricular non communication and the obstructive pattern of hydrocephalus both ventricles being large with the third ventricle being also enlarged but uh, aqueduct is either not visualized or very narrow and fourth ventricle has not proportionately enlarged you may be able to see an aqueductal anatomical obstruction or certainly a lot of uh, lack of aqueductal flow void on t2 weighted mri endoscope is passed through the sheath the lateral ventricle is visualized foramen of munro is identified and then you would be able to see the floor and you you usually puncture midway between the mammillary body and the infundibular races and then dilate this opening with a 3 or 4 french uh, catheter into the prepontine space and to and fro oscillations are the best uh, thing to make sure uh, to give you an idea that uh, your ventricular ostomy is working well people have used a lot of uh, different instruments to make this opening right from leucotome to stereotactic puncturing needles uh, flexible fi fibroscopes uh, fluoroscopic guidance people have used the endoscope tip itself has been used uh, you have uh, you know the forceps being used uh, and uh, some of the forceps are very well designed especially the one which is developed by dr grotenhuis and dr henry schroder they they have a very nice way that you can pinch the third ventricular floor up and cut it away without actually damaging the basilar artery at all and our friend in taiwan dr tai uh, tong uh, wong uses a dormia basket which the urologist use for removing the ureteric stones 
Recently, the German guys have started using the thulium laser, and this can be particularly useful if you have a, a very thick membrane, a fibrous membrane, and a non-transparent kind of membrane, uh, which can be very safely uh, opened up with a thulium, uh, thulium laser. So a typical third ventriculostomy, you should be able to see a dilated furon of Monroe. As soon as you get in, you will be able to see a thinned out floor. You go in front of the basal uh, artery and you make an opening. You increase that opening with to and fro movement of your balloon. You must make sure that uh, you are seeing properly and must make sure you are not in the subdural space, you are in the subarachnoid space, which you make sure by putting your scope through the opening and visualizing all the perforators of the basilar artery. And these are the various steps as you go through. What you need is a width of foramen has to be sufficiently large, usually about seven millimeters, but now pediatric scopes are available, which can uh, take uh, about three millimeters opening is good enough. You should have a thin floor of third ventricle. You should have a downward bulging floor. And most importantly, the basilar should be posterior to the mammillary body. We'll see different scenarios. This is a thick floor. So what you're trying to do is go as close to the as close to the clivus as possible in a thick opaque floor. And once you have done that, you are trying to dilate this opening and you'll see very quickly that there is a second membrane in this patient, which you can virtually see through the uh, transparent balloon. In a moment, as soon as this comes out, you'll be able to see that the second membrane had just about ruptured. Can you see the second membrane now? And then you push your uh, scope through the first as well as the second membrane and make sure you have a big enough opening uh, for the third ventriculostomy to function properly. If you have a very thin membrane, a very stretchable membrane, you can sometimes, the membrane just goes up to the foron of, uh, uh, well, foron magnum and you may not still be able to get an opening. So that such times you will have to pinch the uh, floor up and then you will have to make an opening with the scope. Here I tried to just puncture it with the catheter itself and I managed to open it. But otherwise with a blunt uh, tip of the unipolar cautery, it was virtually impossible uh, to make this opening. Another situation is very small for of Monroe. So you can go without sheath or you can uh, just make the whole thing. You, you cannot then put any other instrument. So here we went ahead and this was a minoscope with which you can actually perforate the floor quite well. We've gone through one layer and the second layer and you can see the basilar perforators quite well. So once you're sure where you are, you can actually do this uh, fairly safely. This is another spina bifida patient, uh, small foron of Monroe. Uh, as you will see, in fact, uh, virtually the foron of Monroe was closed in this patient. Uh, you can see atresia of foron of Monroe but there is a spontaneous septostomy that has happened. So even though I have entered from the right side, I decide to go to the left side after making sure that there is no possible entry into the third ventricle from the right side. I have decided to go through the left side here and from the left, uh, once I have gone through the septum onto the left side, I can visualize the third ventricular floor quite well and uh, then I can do a third ventriculostomy reasonably well. So you need to innovate a little bit to do that. When there is a very narrow space between the clivus and the mammillary bodies, what will you do? You, have, you go as close to your uh, clivus as possible. The only danger in that is you might sometimes enter the subdural space rather than uh, entering the subarachnoid space. Here you can see there is a small opening here which shows that uh, there's a kind of a spontaneous ETV that has happened, but you need to enlarge it because there is no flapping or the second membrane is probably stopping it. So we are opening into the narrow space there and I'm trying to direct my uh, instrument towards the clivus rather than towards the basilar artery. And once I have done that, uh, then I would uh, put the balloon to dilate it. And now you can see the two and fro movement and the whole uh, cavity uh, is seen now and the pulsations of the membrane are seen as well. When the opening occasionally happens posterior to the basilar artery, you need to correct that. You need to come out immediately. 
do not dilate do not damage the perforators immediately make another opening or you can enlarge the opening with the scissors or uh, the shoulder's forceps uh, very small space here trying to dilate the space when i realize that i am posterior to the basilar artery and stop there itself i feel i am not in the proper space i see that the perforators are all in front of me so then i go further and i make another opening close to the clivus and then dilate that opening uh, to make a bigger uh, opening there so basically the clival line serves as a very important arachnoid landmark and i think it is a very good tactile navigation for you to do a third ventricular ostomy very safely and i think uh, uh, i i i find this to be one of the most important landmarks especially in a country where i work where i need to use third ventricular ostomy several times in post infective hydrocephalus where the landmarks are not so commonly seen clavel line becomes a very important landmark as you will see later on with a few cases another thing that can help you in a very difficult situation like here in a scarred third ventricular floor we had no other recourse to the fact that we had to use navigation you can see the uh, several scarring into the prepontine space but with the usg guidance as well as the navigation guidance we have been able to get into the third ventricle as well as into the uh, prepontine space quite well so these kind of equipment can help you but you still need to be very very careful when you are doing it in a uh, when the membrane is not transparent and we are not sure of your landmarks endoscopic third ventricle ostomy can also be done with a fiber optic endoscope and specially this is i think for uh, third ventricle ostomy it may not be so important but if you want to do a choroid plexus coagulation or if you want to do an aqu aqueductoplasty through the same opening this can be extremely useful what are the unfavorable features for etv i think if you have a structural anomaly which are impeding the procedures if you have avm or tumor obstructing the floor if you have enlarged massa intermedia if there is really insufficient space between the mammillary body and basilar and clivus or basilar artery ectasia you should probably not attempt it a feasible alternative to do standard third ventricle ostomy described by uh, dr subodh raju one of our colleagues from hyderabad and also by yoki mortel in uh, germany is the lamina terminalis third ventricle ostomy which is the second option and you can get into the interhemispheric fissure like the basilar artery which you see in, in the uh, general uh, uh, etv you will be able to see the anterior communicating artery when you go into the uh, interhemispheric fissure i have personally uh, not very great experience with this and uh, do not have a video to show when do i abandon uh, the third ventricular ostomy when the post inflammatory distortion of the ventricular anatomy does not allow me to be certain that i am going to reach where i want to reach i can probably i i would like to abandon if you have a very thick ventricular uh, floor i think it's a good idea to abandon when you find that as soon as you enter the uh, prepontine space you see that it is obstructed by scar tissue there is no further point in keeping on dilating and trying to get it bilateral absence of furon of munro can actually be a contraindication but as you i have shown you in one case you can do a septostomy and may be able to perform the procedure and of course poor visibility due to cloudy csf is a definite no no there is a lot of discussion about in which uh, etiology third ventricular ostomy is successful and at what age and this is a very good paper which has shown you that uh, even in very small children up to 3 months if you have purely obstructive hydrocephalus like congenital aqueduct stenosis it works quite well usually uh, children about 6 months with 
obstructive hydrocephalus of any kind i think are extremely good candidates it can it is a safe procedure to do even during pregnancy as this paper has shown with five pregnant women uh, what about spinal dysraphism robert jones had shown this grotenheis has also shown it in his study and later on charlie teo has shown in another study that primary attempts at doing third ventriculostomy are not very successful in infancy but if these patients present with shunt malfunction at a later age and what we call now secondary etv if we do that in these patients it can be successful especially if the pattern of uh, hydrocephalus appears to you to be more of a obstructive pattern and these are actually the figures uh, that they have shown what are the success rate of what is called a secondary third ventriculostomy in these patients similarly grotenheis has very classically shown that the primary success rate in his patients was only 23% while whenever he did as a second procedure after a primary procedure was done elsewhere and he had to do it for blockage of shunt the percentage of success was as high as 77.8% tumor related hydrocephalus etv works very well should it be done in every patient this is being this debated quite often in europe there are lot of centers where etv is done as a pre operative measure with the feeling that post operatively these patients will have less csf leak and less need of shunts but the general percentage of post operative hydrocephalus in such patients is only about 10 to 14% and therefore lot of your etvs will go waste and we do not do it as a regular procedure i think uh, all the three papers i am showing you are from europe which have shown that it it has given them a big benefit in our parts of the world and in africa i think one of the most important consideration is can we use endoscopy in the management of patients with tubercular meningitis and it seems that you can use it in chronic cases once the acute disease has burnt out and the main reason for that is that there are lot of basal exudates and uh, as i showed you in that uh, child similarly in here you can see exudates in the prepontine space which do not allow you to be successful while if you do it in a treated patient you should be able to see some tubercles etc uh, which are probably healed but you are able to make a third ventriculostomy fairly well in such patients and if you get a good uh, flapping membrane it is more likely to succeed uh, the african guys the cape town guys have actually shown that this can be found out by pre operative method of just injecting a little air in the pre Uh, in the lumbar space if you see the air getting into the lateral ventricle that means it is communicating hydrocephalus and you should go for a shunt and if you do not see any air in the ventricle at the end of one hour you should presume that it is obstructive hydrocephalus and try out a third ventriculostomy something similar depending on uh, how you find that the patient has communicating or non communicating hydrocephalus you should consider etv according to the velour group as well and there are two or uh, there are in fact four major studies now from india which show that in acute phase you have about 30% chance of success while in chronic phase you have a chance of more than 70% success in uh, uh, th these are the various uh, series in fact more than four series what is considered very important which chinali has brought to the fore is that the radiological anatomy whenever you decide in a shunt failure patient that would he be benefited with what is called secondary etv you should see their uh, ventricular anatomy if the ventricular anatomy shows you that the lateral ventricles and third ventricle are bigger than fourth ventricle and you have a reasonable good prepontine space you should probably give everybody a chance to go for a third ventriculostomy and the radiological evaluation is probably the most important part even in post meningitic hydrocephalus like uh, we just discussed so this is one patient who came to me with a shunt failure in a very bad state actually and you can see that the uh, there is a scarring here this girl has completed her uh, treatment with uh, anti tubercular treatment and here i have been able to make a clean opening into the prepontine space again with the uh, and we usually make sure that it is working by what we call the cisterno cine cisternography uh, which we do after about 3 months 
what about pyogenic meningitis not as a primary procedure but this is a child who came with actually a shunt insertion the shunt insert got infected so we first treated that and after the shunt infection cleared up by that time the child was about four months we decided to go ahead and uh, do a third ventriculostomy and this has worked quite well for now more than uh, four years follow-up he has not required any further procedure and has grown quite well so in pyogenic ventriculitis, you do not get so much of basal cisternal scarring and you can be good after you have completed your antibiotic treatment. I think Abhay Kulkarni has come out with this idea that depending on the age, etiology and previous shunt placement and the age of the patient, uh, you can score them. And usually if you have a better than 50% score, you can advise the parents or the child that he should probably be given a chance to do a third ventriculostomy and I think less than 50% you would like to avoid it though you have to leave it to the patient. There are many patients we see in India over a period of time with social media talking too much about uh, third ventriculostomy want that to be done as a first procedure and after counseling them we have actually done uh, Third ventriculostomy is up to an age of about six weeks or so. <coughs> there is a feeling that the ETV score may not be completely faultless and people have shown that acute elevation of ICP reacts better to third ventriculostomy than a chronically raised pressure. And this has been shown actually in a, a series of about 60 patients uh, in uh, California. We actually wrote up a review for this uh, uh, recently as to what is the success and failure and what is the role of uh, secondary ETV, which have been published uh, recently in uh, uh, Journal of Pediatric Neurosurgery, the US Journal and the Korean Neurosurgery Journal. Uh, we, we had an experience of 36 patients at that time where we had almost 70% success rate when patients were treated when they came with a shunt failure. There are certain additional procedures which you may uh, be done to help the patient. In patients who have blocked shunts and the fourth ventricle is enlarged, we perform an additional aqueductoplasty. Like in this patient, the third ventriculostomy is just about getting over. Once you have seen the basilar, you come out, you go a little posterior and you will dilate this only with the uh, ventricular catheter and then usually we leave uh, the catheter in the fourth ventricle and if it is not draining well then connect it to a shunt later on. Choroid plexus coagulation became very popular with Ben Warf's uh, work in uh, Uganda and it showed that ETV plus CPC gave a much better uh, result of 66% follow uh, of 66% uh, uh, success compared to 47% in post-infective, post-hemorrhagic patients. Uh, and actually Abhay Kulkarni has studied these patients on a long-term follow-up and have shown that their uh, overall development has also not suffered. But a similar experiment done across nine centers in the United States by the Hydrocephalus Research Group has shown that it has not given superior results compared to shunts and therefore how much CPC helps is still a matter of consideration. However, one thing is very clear that uh, the not so good results of CPC may be associated with the fact that uh, unless you use a fiber optic scope, you cannot do a very good uh, choroid plexus coagulation, which Benwarf used to do. And uh, that, that still remains a consideration. If you want to do CPC, you should do as extensive as possible. I think when you have acute ventriculitis, which is a common problem in very young children, endoscopic lavage can give you a lot of relief and a ventricular catheter can be kept like our friend from Malaysia uh, has advised and uh, in Europe also it is becoming popular for post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus that uh, ventricular lavage gives you a much uh, a quicker uh, chance of treating the hydrocephalus and many patients do not require shunts. If they require shunts, they do not require so many revision of shunts, which is a common thing to happen in post-hemorrhagic, post-infective hydrocephalus. In complex multiloculated hydrocephalus, 
it works beautifully i think uh, endoscope is extremely useful uh, to do septostomies to do several fenestrations like in this patient we first did a septostomy because both ventricles were not communicating injected dye made sure that they started communicating then actually went for etv and in this patient uh, we could delay the shunt insertion for a fairly long time and patient was managed only with one shunt eventually so uh, and we we usually make sure in multiseptic hydrocephalus that we have reached all corners by injecting a dye towards the end of it i have recently re written a review of this uh, in child nervous system uh, which you can probably have a look in the yearbook so i will end here and we'll happy to take any questions john okay. is everybody okay. awake yeah thank you no of course of course thank you very much chandra thanks for taking the time right. okay the floor is open for questions or comments for chandra uh excellent video hello can you hear see yes. me yes yeah we can hear you yes i yep. yeah uh, excellent video a lot of experience there we use this etv uh, quite often now uh, i believe that taking the csf away from the ventricular system is not a great idea you know uh, i believe that the csf in the ventricular systems is in a production phase and the csf in the systems is what helps with the cleaning and cooling of the brain so we we had hypothesized it uh, in 2000 uh, Uh, 10 and then from 2007 we have been proposing that the csf goes into the brain uh, it is the csf that goes into the brain to produce csf shift edema which can be addressed by cystinostomy then our studies and uh, things let led us to believe that csf actually goes into the brain to do two things one is cleaning that happens only in the night that is acoporin for dependent and uh, that that happens only in the night so but cooling csf also goes in for cooling and that happens all the time so we wrote this up as a springer uh, a neuroscience a springer neuroscience is annual series chapter and it's been published about 2 years back now there's a lot of uh, evidence for it now the thing is if you take out ventricular csf with a shunt you're actually uh giving less chance for the csf to reach the cisterns and thereby you creating a problem where csf i mean the brain is not cooled and cleaned in another i mean if you ask me how uh we further expanded this if you see uh, this is also related to endoscopic surgery you know all our sinuses they are all lined with wet mucosa so when you take a breath actually what happens is it is like a wet cloth hanging in a room so when you take a breath uh, what happens is these sinuses they the muc the mucosal water they evaporate and then they give away give away latent heat of evaporation and therefore the sinuses start cooling and if you see a heat graph of the the face this area is characteristically blue you know you you see them you see that cool and you know the largest cistern um is the suprasilla cistern and it is in right in the center of this uh, sinuses it's amazing you know and all the vessels travel to the brain from the suprasilla cistern and all the vessels they have a hole around them they have a small pathway around them and this pathway is called the virtual robin spaces so and again this vessels are pulsating so when something is pulsating in a channel it drives the csf up it's not this uh, it is not the uh, capillary flow it is something called the archimedes screw principle so it's pulsating and therefore the csf is driven in you see what a beautiful system it's cooled by the sinuses and this cooled sinuses by convection cools the suprasilla system and then therefore this is pumped up into the uh you know into the brain and this cooling happens all the time um and then cleaning happens in the night so this cleaning and cooling if it's not 
taken care of. We propose that diseases like Alzheimer's, diseases uh, like even diseases like, uh, you know, um, uh, back, I mean, uh, degenerative, other degenerative diseases, uh, all this starts happening, even punch drunkenness, um, all these happens actually. So then we, uh, we started proposing that it, it is actually maybe not a great idea to shun the CSF away from the brain into the abdomen. So we're trying our level best, of course. I mean, uh, we really don't know what happens after the shun because we're not really looking at these patients uh, on a on a terms with very, very strict ways of looking at their development and their mental score and uh, things like that. So I think uh, ETV is a very natural way of uh, doing things. Well, I think it certainly avoids expensive shunts. It, it comes to a level of equilibrium, which, which no shunt can actually uh, ever give you. And uh, shunts are becoming more and more complex, more and more expensive. I think that if you can avoid, it is certainly a worthwhile idea. The only other question which comes to my mind, especially after what you have said, Reducing CSF uh, production by choroid plexus coagulation may also have some harmful effect uh, because less CSF production and especially the kind of chemicals that uh, probably are secreted along with that, uh, lesser concentration of that can also be uh, deleterious to the interior milieu of the ventricular system or the brain itself. So I, I'm not sure if... Uh, CPC is all good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the natural way of the ventricles being the production center and the cisterns being the center where cooling and cleaning is, you know, is done to maintain that the best physiological procedure would be ETV. And I think it should be an it should be in the armamentarium for every single surgeon. Of course, there are some times you just cannot do it, very rarely, but uh, I think most of the time you can get away with uh, an endoscopic uh, third ventriculostomy. Sir, uh, how's the, uh, sir, do you put it, sir? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sir, how's the, uh, is there any use of ETV in post-traumatic hydrocephalus? <laughs> A very good question. I think uh, we really don't know. I think in post-traumatic hydrocephalus, you have two or three mechanisms. Is volume loss part of the mechanism? Then it is unlikely to help. Uh, is it due to the subarachnoid hemorrhage that happened uh, at the time of uh, uh, the injury and later on uh, it has manifested like what happens in NPH kind of a syndrome? I think it can help. How it helps is certainly not known, but given the same analogy as uh, the normal pressure hydrocephalus, many people feel that uh, these are patients who had some kind of a compensated hydrocephalus and something triggered it off, like the minor trauma oh. maybe. So those kind of patients may benefit, but I think generally in a post-traumatic hydrocephalus, it may be In post-traumatic hydrocephalus, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, ah. yes, yes. In post-traumatic hydrocephalus, if it is due to scarring of the basal systems, and uh, then it is unlikely to be very helpful. Yeah, again, one thing in post-traumatic hydrocephalus I would like to say is uh, uh, most of the time people use decompressive hemicrinectomy, which is actually, I would say it is... Uh, you know, I mean, forgive me for being strong about this, but I think it's a criminal procedure. It's not physiologic at all. It's, uh, I mean, the brain is swelling because of CSF shift. Uh, that is why you don't find any CSF in here. And if you allow this brain to be herniated out through that uh, decompressive hemicrinic to me, you just, comp I mean, you just uh, converting a cemetery into a vegetable market. Yes. So, yeah, so it, there's been so many studies and... Uh, we all know how to open systems. It's a bit difficult, of course. It's not, I mean, now there's a lot of guys doing this opening systems and they're finding things. So 
I mean, they're finding, they're finding it not too difficult. I mean, of course, my mistake was to make it too difficult. But then after Roy, Wang, Bharti Ben and the rest of the guys uh, put in their ways of doing cystinostomy, now things have become very simple and uh, there's so, a lot of papers and yeah. I, I, I'm interested in uh, knowing you. You have followed up your patients now for quite some time. It's uh, 10 years is, now. Is, yeah. So is the incidence of hydrocephalus much less? Yes, much patients? less. Yeah, this is exactly what. Yeah, this is exactly what I wanted to tell you. The, our incidence of hydrocephalus is much less. I mean, we find that for the DZ patients, it's almost twenty percent, while our, our hydrocephalus is less than five percent. So this is what I wanted to tell you when uh, uh, Gautam had raised the possibility. I mean, the the, the probability of this uh, ETV being used in. Uh, um, in, in, in post-traumatic hydrocephalus. I wanted to tell him that maybe the primary procedure it should itself should be changed rather than uh, going and treating a complication which happened because of the primary procedure. Yes, sir. We are advocating your uh, <laughs> sister nostomy. We started doing it. Okay, excellent, excellent. Other questions? Don't be shy. Uh, hello, sir. Yes. yes. Uh, sir, any uh, any uh, fixed measurement like pre-pointing system, this much measurement should be there before doing ETV. You measure it on the MRI prior to doing taking up for ETV. Can you can you just uh, repeat again? Sir, any any fixed cutoff? For that pre pointing system, any measurement you take uh, before, prior to doing in the uh, uh, the ETV? No, the measurement is not described, but you shouldn't have uh, on a T2 weighted sagittal image. You can usually see the basilar artery very clearly in the pre pontine space, and you should be able to see some CSF between the basilar artery and the posterior edge of the clivus. Okay. I, I think even if you see a thin film, I'm usually okay with it. You you can you can displace the basilar artery posteriorly, but you need to get an opening there. So you you should see some CSF between the basilar art, artery and the uh, clival dura. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that how high it comes and where does it bifurcate. Sometimes if you have a very tortuous artery, then you may not be able to get entry. But luckily, it doesn't happen very often, especially in children. Okay, sir. And regarding any evidence, sir, of uh, ETV used in NPH, any success rate? ETV or in NPH, experience? the highest success rate is actually in Gangemi series from Naples in Italy, who has shown virtually more than 60% success rate. And uh, the other guy who has shown a good success rate is uh, Dr. Oi from Japan. And both of them are... Uh, very sure in their feeling that this is a different kind of hydrocephalus. This is a hydrocephalus which has been sort of chronic uh, but not apparent occult hydrocephalus which becomes uh, manifest uh, for some reason in the late age and when that happens third ventriculostomy works. These are not patients who otherwise we call communicating hydrocephalus due to various other diseases uh, which produce normal pressure hydrocephalus. Thank you, sir. Okay, more comments, questions? Uh, Prof, regarding the post-operative post period, unlike the patients who had shunned, where we see the radiological findings are more favorable, how long do you wait until you say that this ETV is not working and the patient really needs a repeat procedure or a shunt radiologically? Right. Very, very, very important and very practical question. I think the most important thing uh, which tells you that your ETV is probably not working, especially in young children, is the CSF leak from the wound. The earliest sign that it is not working, you will find some swelling at the time of site of your burr hole or you will probably find a few drops of CSF coming out. The initial response to this is that, in, especially in very young children, that the subarachnoid space is not prepared to take such a uh, heavy load of CSF and therefore do daily lumbar punctures. And most people 
uh, in pediatric neurosurgery practice do two or three days uh, daily lumbar punctures on these patients feeling that the overload of csf is taken away and the subarachnoid space gets used to uh, increase csf and starts absorbing it but if it doesn't uh, work beyond 3 days then you have two options one option is to go back and see if your stoma is still open if the stoma is closed then you need to reopen it of course by doing a redo third ventriculostomy if the stoma is open then your best bet is to just put in a shunt and probably hope that it will work till the child is big enough to take care of his csf in the cisterns and you can probably re attempt a third ventriculostomy after the child is older what we do is uh we we usually do not immediately rush in to do a repeat third ventriculostomy or endoscopy uh, inspection we usually through the same borehole whenever we are in doubt especially in post hemorrhagic post uh, meningitic patients at the end of the third ventriculostomy i leave a omai reservoir and in that reservoir we inject 2 cc of dye uh this urographin or uh, uh, the uh, what's the other dye which we use metrizamide or uh, omnipec and uh, you take a scan after 1 hour you usually find the dye has gone into the subarachnoid space if your third ventriculostomy is open by 6 hours it usually goes out of the cisternal system and you do not see it on the scan if it is still persistent after 6 hours you know that your etv is working but your cisternal absorption is not good and i would usually put the shunt uh, the next day in such a patient thank you thank you so much okay any more comments questions okay dr devar thank you very much and tomorrow uh, do you know what the topic is going to be uh tomorrow we can do some uh, tumors uh, what we can do with endoscope uh, uh maybe uh, the minimal invasive uh, endoscopic uh, endoscope assisted microscopic approaches okay. yeah 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 um i can also show a case for tomorrow and uh, let chandra show the rest of the rest of the case i can show probably uh uh telum uh, telovelar meningioma so a posterior third ventricular meningioma so um maybe uh that would be about 5 minutes or 10 minutes and uh, so you can start off and then i'll take over uh, i if it's okay no no i i can wait for you to finish and then i can, I can <laughs> whichever way it's comfortable okay okay thank you very much everybody and we'll see thank you, you so tomorrow much. yeah thank you see thank you, you. thank you thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye.